Hey guys, welcome to another Gatorade video. Today we'll be talking about cardiac catheterization and how to manage and identify some of the common complications of a cardiac cath. So I guess the most important thing to know is what a cardiac cath is. Um, people say it a lot, you might not know exactly what it means. So a catheterization is to inject radioactive dye in, into the heart to visualize the coronary arteries. Typically this is done in a cath lab. It usually looks something like this. So as you'll see, the patient is covered with a cloth. They're staring at a bunch of screens. There's an x-ray machine, and then you have a cardiologist and the scrub tech. So what's going on here is you can see there's a wire going in. So typically you access through the femoral artery in the groin. You can also use the radial artery at the wrist. So we talked about the definition of a cardiac cath. You might also hear the word PCI. So this stands for percutaneous coronary intervention. More commonly, it also can just be called an interventional cath. And usually a PCI is done by an interventional cardiologist, whereas a diagnostic cath is usually done by a general cardiologist or an interventional. The word ventriculography is when you look at the heart chambers and coronography is specifically looking at the coronary arteries. So when we do a cath, what are we really seeing? Everyone's seen this diagram of the heart where you have your right coronary, left coronary, LAD, not shown here is the circumflex wrapping around. When we're looking at it via fluoroscopy, AKA radioactive dye, it looks a little different. So you'll typically see something like this and you have the LAD here, the left coronary, or I mean the left circumflex. And typically we won't get into this right now, but there's a lot of different views on cats. So the x-ray kind of rotates around the patient and it can either come from the right side called an RAO view or the left side called an LAO view. And there's lots of different cath views such as um, spider, rainbow. You can really look these up. Uh, I don't feel like explaining them. So one of the most common questions that you might get asked as a medical student, either in the ER, in the internal medicine service, or on your cardiology rotation or ICU rotation, even urgent care is whether you cath an end STEMI. So kind of defining an end STEMI for those that don't know, it's someone without ST elevation on EKG that also has positive cardiac biomarkers, AKA troponin. So essentially what an end STEMI is, is it's not total occlusion, but there has been heart damage. So you, yes, you've had a heart attack. Long story short, you probably cath an end STEMI. Very rarely have I seen someone with an NSTEMI who didn't go to the cath lab. And if you want to figure out exactly who gets to go to the cath lab when they have an NSTEMI, there's a couple of tools you can use, including the heart score and the grace score, as well as the Timmy score. From my understanding, the Timmy isn't used as much as these, at least where I was. So you can look at the, some of the th some of the things that would get an NSTEMI patient into the cath lab that would be an advanced age, multiple risk factors such as diabetes, prior MI, existing um, carotid disease, et cetera, what, how high their initial troponin was, as well as their age. So um, just looking back, because these are really some of the questions that you'll be asked is, um, what to do with the different acute coronary syndrome. So obviously a STEMI goes to the cath lab within 90 minutes. A lot of the times in the hospital, you will not even see these patients because EMS is bringing them directly to the cath lab. So if you've ever been in the hospital and wondered, hey, why don't we see a bunch of STEMIs? It's because they're already in the cath lab. So if you're seeing someone with an MI in the hospital, they probably have an NSTEMI. Um, and so treatment of an NSTEMI you have all pr pretty much remember the mnemonic MONA, uh, morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and uh, aspirin. Not used, as m not used too much anymore. So kind of what we see now usually is beta blocker, dual antiplatelet therapy, ACE inhibitor, and a statin. O2 if SATs are less than 90. You typically don't give morphine because it might mask future chest pain. 
So you're going to calculate some of your risk scores before consulting cardiology. And if cardiology determines the patient to be high risk, they will do a cath, typically before 24 hours. The management of unstable angina is very patient dependent and would take too long to really get into here. But many unstable anginas are treated like an NSTEMI. It really depends on how many risk factors they have and whether they are feeling better after nitrates. So we're gonna get to our first question, which is a patient with an NSTEMI had a cath done. Their chest pain is now gone. They're coming back at their two week cardiology follow-up and their blood pressures are now in the 80s. Um, there's no groin pain, mass, or brewy, and the patient has some back pain. When you flip the patient over, you notice that on their back is a pretty significant bruise. So what are we going to do now? Well, what we have suspicion for is a retroperitoneal bleed, and this can either happen immediately or a little bit after. So what you're seeing here is that there has been a puncture of the femoral artery that didn't close up and crucially it happened above the inguinal ligament. Now you have bleeding in the abdomen and obviously this is either going to cause stomach pain or back pain, but most crucially you will not get groin pain and you will not see bruising around the initial access site. So this can kind of be confusing and if you don't get a good history and you don't know the patient had a cath, um, this might trigger a whole separate workup. But in any case, you're going to get a CT scan, and the CT scan will be a very hard-to-miss retroperitoneal hematoma or bleed. Let's do kind of the same patient. They also had a cath done, chest pain is gone, and now they have some swelling in the groin area where we went in. There is a continuous murmur that is heard, which means it happens during both systole and diastole. And crucially, when you're palpating it, you can kind of feel this pulsating, palpable thrill. It feels very odd. And so what is the diagnosis here? It's going to be an AV fistula. This is when the femoral artery was bleeding, and due to all the clotting factors and healing factors that get released when the body's vessels are injured, kind of anastomosed with the femoral vein near it. So this can either go away on its own, or if it's very large, you might either inject some thrombin into it, or if it's very big, you might open it up with surgery. Just an integration that when you hear the word thrill, you should also be thinking about dialysis fistulas. So these also have a thrill. If you have ever felt one of these, you know, it kind of feels like um, it's a very alien sensation. This is not a natural feeling thing. When you, The first time you feel one of these and place your hand over it, um, you'll be very disturbed. It's a very unnatural thing. So when you hear the word thrill, it's, uh, you know, you should be thinking about a fistula. Same patient. So now they have a good bit of groin pain at the access site. There's no thrill this time, but we have a small palpable mass. There's nothing heard on auscultation. Um, so we have a small palpable mass. There's nothing heard. Um, the diagnosis here is going to be a hematoma. So this is just a fancy word for a bruise. So it's some blood that has extravasated from the initial access site. And the real way to treat these is with internal tamponade. Same patient. Patient had a NSTEMI uh, with a cath recently. Their chest pain is now gone. They have a good bit of groin pain at the access site. I know this is all sounding familiar. This time they have a mass that pulsates and a small systolic brewy is heard. So the diagnosis here is going to be a pseudoaneurysm. And I believe of the couple complications that we've discussed, I believe this is the most common. So these are treated with either a thrombin injection or a surgery. And so really what you need to know is that a hematoma will have a mass and no brewery. A pseudoaneurysm will have a bulging pulsatile mass with a systolic brewery. And an AV fistula will have no mass with a continuous brewery. The management of these is kind of dependent. And that would be a much harder question. I really doubt you'll be asked how to manage these complications because they don't happen that frequently. 
but a good rule of thumb is that with hematoma, you're going to do internal tamponade. With pseudoaneurysm, you'll either surgically repair it or inject thrombin into it. And with an AV fistula, you either wait for it to go away or you surgically repair it. Kind of depends on where you are, how bad it is, and whether you can get them to a vascular surgeon or not. One integration, because we're talking about the femoral vessels, is that a hernia surgeon will keep in mind that they have to avoid the triangle of doom when they're doing a laparoscopic hernia repair. So all the vessels look really weird when you're looking at them from the inside. So you want to um, avoid the triangle of doom because it's where the femoral artery is. So it's kind of just a reminder that different specialties and different surgeries, they're all looking at the same anatomic structures. And um, I just find it funny that one person really avoids what another person is immediately sticking a needle into. So just some take home points. Complications of cardiac cath are frequently tested, but not frequently encountered. These people are really, really good at their jobs. They really don't mess up much. In my two weeks of being at the cath lab, we didn't see any of these and following a bunch of cardiology patients, none of them really had these kinds of complications. The most complication, the most common complication that I saw was just, um, little bit of mild groin pain the day after the procedure. And so you want to keep in mass, you want to keep in mind whether or not a mass is present and you want to listen for a brewery, which is either going to be systolic or continuous. The last thing to know is that hemodynamic instability plus back pain, you want to think about a retroperitoneal bleed. Thank you.